Hey, everybody, Richard Blissbrook here, and welcome to Network Marketing Hero Call number 100. How about that? In the last three years, I have interviewed 99 people that have crushed the four-year career, like $10,000 a month, all the way up to, gosh, I think I interviewed one uh, lady that was making $400,000 a month. And so uh, as the disclaimer and reminder, uh, kind of like don't try this at home, although actually we do want you to try it at home, just don't expect the same results because what we interview here on the Hero Call are people that are absolutely extraordinary heroes in the network marketing profession. What they've done is certainly not typical. It's knock it out of the park extraordinary. And so what we use these extraordinary, almost, you know, one of a kind, one out of a million sales leaders stories for is not to suggest that you will do the same thing in building your business, but whatever it is you want to do is certainly doable when you map it in the context of what these people have done. And so I'm going to briefly introduce my guests today, which are highly esteemed in the network marketing profession. They represent five different legacy network marketing companies. I'll talk about that briefly. And they have built enormous businesses, but more importantly than the enormous businesses they built, they are extraordinary ambassadors of the network marketing profession. They are people that subscribe to and live out of the philosophy of a rising tide lifts all ships. So even though all six of us are competitors, we are really collaborators. We are friends and we support each other and we do calls for each other and we champion each other and we love each other and we hug each other and we have fun together. And more importantly than perhaps our individual success is that we're just awesome role models for the network marketing profession. So first on our esteemed panel list is Donna Johnson. She's in Carefree, Arizona, which is her primary residence, but she also has a home on a lake in Wisconsin and a home in Sweden with her uh, stunning husband, uh, Thomas, who's also a very successful network marketer in his own right in a different company. And Donna has been around network marketing, has been in network marketing now for almost 40 years. She's the top distributor in Arbonne. She has, I don't know, probably close to a million people on her team. One of the things that I find fascinating about Donna is she has over a thousand uh, people that have qualified for those white Mercedes. So I'm trying to get her to do like a profile picture where all thousand of those Mercedes are lined up somewhere. Uh, she has uh, built a huge, huge team, obviously, and she is the anchor tenant in Arbon around the world. And she's also a super giver, uh, the founder of Spirit Wings, which is a charity that takes care of kids all over the world. So, Donna, welcome to Hero Call number 100. Thank you, Richard. Congratulations. This is pretty exciting. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Uh, next is Jordan Adler. Jordan, are, are you are you there? Are you looking good? I'm here, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> is that mic working? <laughs> no, it's, just, it's a prop. It it's a prop. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jordan Adler. He is the top distributor in Send Out Cards, another legacy company based in Salt Lake City. But Jordan lives in Las Vegas, of course. You know, somewhere very high up in the Mandarin hotel in one of those suites that you can't even get up to. Nobody will even let you get within 100 yards of it. And then he also lives in some kind of cave in Jerome, Arizona, which just gives him some contrast. And then he has a beautiful mountain home and so he can get out of the heat of Las Vegas. And Jordan, uh, you know, most of you have probably heard your story. All of these people, by the way, have been the subject of uh, the most popular hero calls that we've done. So you can hear their story by listening to their individual hero call. Jordan, you know, he might hold the record for the most number of network marketing companies that he's failed in <laughs> before he actually <laughs> succeeded, which says something pretty cool about send out cards. <laughs> Even Jordan can do it. <laughs> so Jordan, thank you uh, for being here and welcome to the call. Thank you. I'm happy. And 
Next is Carolyn Reitman, who she's in uh, the Keys, way, way, way down there by Cuba. And Carolyn is also like a 40-year veteran of network marketing. And she is with Shackley, one of the uh, original and most successful uh, distributors in the Shackley Corporation. And Carolyn came to network marketing from a very prestigious job in the Peace Corps and you know, she was looking for something totally different and she found it in network marketing and found it in Shackley. And she spent the last 40 years just killing it in that company, not just her own business, but serving the entire company and the entire profession. And she's just a beautiful, ethical, highly spiritual and powerful woman. Carolyn, wave Thank to everybody. You. Thank you. Honor to be here. And I'm with all my mentors. Yeah, And look at all those awards you have behind you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you told me you wanted it to be inside. I'd go I did. Outside. Yeah, you go, yeah, you're usually out there on the porch with That's all the it. birds and the wave crashing. And uh, next we have uh, Adam Green, uh, who is, uh, what are you now, Adam? 29 years old? Correct. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen when you turn 30? The <laughs> world is going to change. So uh, Adam's parents, uh, successful network marketers for decades, and uh, Adam got involved, I don't know, age 21 or 22. You can listen to his story too by going to his call. I met Adam, I think, when he was 22 years old, and uh, he was looking to hit it big in network marketing. And he has, he's like risen to be a seven figure earner every year in young living essential oils. And I think the youngest top distributor in the company um, right now, he's at the owner's retreat lodge you know, up in some forest in Utah, just coming off a retreat. Uh, so Adam, say hi to everybody. Hi everybody. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and and then we then we have the infamous Tom Chenault, who is probably in Longmont, Carl, Colorado. But oh, by the way, Adam Green lives in Kelowna, British Columbia, like the wine country of British Columbia. He's Canadian. Uh, and so we have Tom Chenault. Uh, of the Tom Chenault radio show, who's in Longmont, Colorado. Tom is the master distributor in Longevity, something like 400,000 people on his team, and a 20 plus veteran of network marketing, and a true extraordinary ambassador of the network marketing profession. Tommy, are you there? I am here with all my awards behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. You have an Indian on a horse growing out of your head. <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So here's the format of today's hero call. We have these five awesome spiritual experience, super wise leaders. And how I'm going to flow through the next hour is just by asking them some questions that they're each going to perhaps tackle. Sometimes they might skip it. Uh, but these are prearranged questions, which is usually not how I do a hero call. But for time's sake, we're going to be a little more organized today. And so we're going to start with Donna and just go all the way through Tom. And then at some point, we may flip it and start with Tom so he gets some appropriate <laughs> airtime. So here's my first question for you, Donna. And then you can flip it to Jordan and Carolyn and Adam, and then finally to Tom, what is the one thing, Donna, one thing and one thing only that you have found to be the most important, me, the most profound thing that you can coach a brand new distributor? So I signed up today. What would you have me do one thing in the next week? that would prepare me to have success in the business? What is the one most important thing? And I know there's some obvious things, 
So I've already coached everybody. You know, if Donna comes up with the most obvious, the most profound, because it's just the truth, then, of course, Jordan has to have plan B, which I'm <laughs> sure you will have. I have so, Donna, you get first choice. All what right. is the number one most profound thing a new distributor must do to prepare <laughs> themselves for success? Yeah, there's, there's, there's many. And I just have to say, you know, I love to say there's no U-Haul at the end of a hearse. And really one of the best things about this profession is the relationships and the friendships. And so this is so cool to be with all of you. And uh, just, I would say the, the one, oh, and I, um, Tom, I have a little angel on my shoulder here. <laughs> so um I think it's just really helping them understand the profession and how it's so different than trading hours for dollars and uh, manage their expectations because so many people give up before payday in the 40 years that I've been in this profession, just watching people uh, give up before payday. And of course, your book for your career is one thing that will help them understand the profession so they don't quit before payday. I think that's super important that they understand, you know, put your entrepreneurial hat on. You're not trading hours for dollars. This is an asset income that you're building. And if they understand that, they'll stay in for the long haul. Yeah. The delayed gratification income model. Thank you, Donna. That's awesome. Jordan, what do you got? Well, um, first thing that comes to mind is I want them to have a story. And I think that most people can get a story in their first week if they follow a protocol of using the product every day. Um, every company is a little bit different, but for example, you can lose some weight in a, in a week. Um, and if it's a weight loss product, I recommend that somebody get on that product and use it every day and create a story and, uh, or, or re you know, recommend a couple other people do it. But, but I think um, the, the answer to the question would be to just have somebody use the product every day and, and with the intention of creating a story in the book that they can then share. Or how about fasting? What if I just fasted for a week? <laughs> That's good, Jordan. I love that story. So, so important. Carolyn Reitman, what do you got? I would say find a buddy. Find a buddy, find a friend, find a colleague. It may be the first person that becomes your prospective business partner. It may be someone who's simply a cheerleader on the side so that whatever it is that you begin to create, you're not creating by yourself. You've got somebody that goes along with you. And then together you can begin to create those foundational things of using the products and, and everything else. But you've got someone that you can kind of be a cheerleader with. Yeah, like uh, running buddy is often what we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, so like w one of the ways I've heard that s said before is if you drive three hours to an event and no one shows up, if you're alone, it's devastating. If you're with your running buddy, it's hilarious. Yes. And the difference is profound. Uh, okay, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Adam Green, what's the one thing? you insist a brand new distributor do in their first week to set them up to win? So along the lines of where Donna let off well, not quitting before payday, the thing they need to do in their first week is, is earn a payday. So get their first enrollment, customer, distributor, but something that they're actually... When they log into their virtual office, they see somebody as part of their team right away because people tend to not quit if they have a team. If they don't have a team, then they're much more likely to check out. So if, if you can do that in your first week, great. Uh, our pay plans, monthly pay plans. So it's more if you can do it in their first month, then, then they're in, they'll get their first check. But if you got some of their first week, you're you know, four times ahead of that schedule. Yeah, that's super smart. Super smart. Uh, thank you, Adam. Tom Chenault. You know, all the good answers are already gone. So <laughs> gonna go with this one. I would tell you to fire your brain and hire your heart mm. and get your agenda out of the way and remember to drop people off right where they want to be. That way you're not going to be experienced disappointment out of the gate. And you're obviously using your buddy or your call partner and things like that. But the critical for thing for me is to get these people to understand that it is indeed a marathon, not a, sp a sprint. 
and not to blow their best relationships out of the gate. So, Tom, let me uh, spin back. So I want to be clear so the audience is clear. What do you mean? So I'm a new distributor, and you say, all right, Brooke, the first thing we're going to do here is get you out of your head and into your heart. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do next. Take that what, big, would, what would that coaching conversation sound like? Take that big prob, that big pile of product that you were going to take to the restaurant with you and leave it in your car and get to know that person one on one, figure out what they want to buy and then come back and sell that to them instead of throwing up on them with your agenda. And you will save the friendship and probably have a business partner, maybe not today, but down the road. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> got it and if you want to know any more about that just follow tom chenault because that's his niche all right beautiful tom thank you all right here's the next question uh and we'll take it back to donna so donna i am a distributor i've been around for it doesn't matter how long a week a year 10 years and i'm in a funk I'm curled up in the fetal position on the couch, sucking my thumb. I'm thinking about all the reasons why this won't work. And uh, I'm making up all the stories about why it hasn't worked. And I'm thinking about all the things I'd rather be doing than building my asset empire. And so you get me on the phone or you get me in person. And I know there's a lot of conversation, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of things you might tell me, but my question to you is, what is the one question? If you only had one question to ask me, the intention of the question is to bounce me off the couch, thumb out of my mouth, out the front door, on the phone, on the computer, back in action. What is the one question you would ask me? Well, I'm really passionate about this subject because um, people get into different paces and different momentums, plateaus, dips, you know, and uh, I believe every morning when you look in the mirror, you have to re-sponsor yourself. So really knowing what their why and their vision is and asking them to repeat it back so they can hear themselves repeat their vision and their why And then I just simply ask them, uh, do you want to shrink your goal or do you want to raise your activity? And 99% of the time, Richard, they tell me they want to raise their activity. And uh, I just launched one yesterday. Um, We just take a two week time block and we go just into a major momentum blitz. And I refer it to like uh, running. So when I go work out and run, I hate it, uh, but I do it for my health and my heart. And if I'm in a jogging pace, my trainer will say to me, okay, let's do some sprints. And I hate it, but I do it. But I, and so I just relay that to, in the business. If you go into a full on sprint for a couple of weeks, get your business back in momentum and they'll see a big, big difference. Uh, You know, that pace, they can't keep that sprint pace forever, but they'll get back into a running and jogging Mm -hmm. pace. Maybe they've been sitting, you know, maybe they've been walking, but their vision and their dreams and their desires is for something more. And, you know, what would it look like in the future uh, if they just sit back and and don't create what they've dreamed and what their vision is and Mm -hmm. make them sick? (laughs) <laughs> and and make them better. I love that question, Donna. Uh, uh, are, do you want to lower your goals? Do you want to lower your expectations? Do you want to shrink that side of the equation? Are you ready to do that? That's very profound. Awesome. Thank you. Jordan, what do you got? All right. So I, I would believe that Donna probably would have asked more than one question, but I believe when it really comes down to it, but you, you kind of asked her to just ask one. Right. So, uh, so what I would do as far as a first question goes, I found that whenever somebody has an objection, whether it's about themselves or about someone else that they need to vent, 
And until they, they're not going anywhere mentally until they vent. So the question I would ask would be, honestly, what's up? That's where I would start. Like, so have them vent, have them complain, have them spew out all the negative stuff that they're feeling first. And then I would go to where Donald went. Yeah, I love that. I want them to refocus. I want them to begin to refocus on their dreams and their aspirations and their original reason why they got started in the first place. But they're not going there until they vent and let you know everything that's bothering them about and why they've checked out. Yeah, beautiful. Love that. Nice work, Jordan. Carolyn, you only get one question. Two of them have already been taken. What was what would be the question you would ask the thumb sucker? I, I would go back to exactly what what Donna and Jordan have said. And rather than just emphasizing the what if you can accomplish, do you want to quit? Are you happy where you are? Do you want what were the original reasons you wanted to do this? And are you going to be more comfortable if you stay there? And you got perfect permission to quit. But I do want to drill into the why they actually said they wanted to in the first place. And then ask them, are you doing anything in personal development and so on? That's the fixes. But really, it boils down to why do they want to bother? Because this is a long haul. This is not a snap your fingers and go eat the candy and it's going to be done. Yeah, I love that, Carolyn. I, that's one of my favorite questions is, well, it's actually a request. It's not a question. I invite you to quit. <laughs> There's no shame in quitting. In fact, most people have. They just haven't sent in their letter of resignation. How about you just quit? Let's just, you know what, let's pop a couple of beers and, uh, oh, sorry, Tom. We don't cop a cup. We'll have a cup of coffee and we'll celebrate your quitting. And that does tend to thump people's bowl. Adam, what do you got? One question for the thumb sucker. Well, we're on, we're now on question number four. Uh, <laughs> you don't you're slim pickings. <laughs> yeah. Um, K- Carolyn's question is usually my go-to one, but uh, probably a little further along, or if I'm going to be adding some shock value, uh, most of my marketplace are parents, people who have you know younger children right now, and so uh, a big question is what kind of example do you want to set for your children <laughs> oh, Jesus. It's, it's like, that's like a mike that's like a mike tyson to the nose oh my god <laughs> I'm, I'm on question four here <laughs> that's and, stout for a 29 year old brand new dad isn't it he's stout i like that what kind of example does that set for your kids or not, like, does it set? Like, do you want to set and have have them, you know, <laughs> emphasize the qualities of character that they want to? Uh, <laughs> I'm really warm in here all of a sudden. Oh, nice job, Adam. I love that. Uh, all right, Tom Chenault, your cleanup batter. What do you got? It's the same thing I do in Alcoholics Anonymous with every one of those guys that are stuck in the same spot. I ask them how it's working for them. Nice. What is it that you're getting? What's the payoff for you being the way you are? Who are you comparing yourself to? What's got you stuck to bust through it? And it works like a charm. Yeah. I mean, uh, Tom, you've been, uh, your parallels to AA and uh, you're right on 30 years, right? Yesterday was 30 years? Uh, it's a Saturday, but this is, yeah, like, however you're doing this, yes. It was yeah. just- Right. <laughs> Depends what time zone you're in. 30 years sober. And one of the things that I've been uh, paying attention to, Tom came and visited Kimmy and I in Australia, I don't know, a month or two ago. And uh, we had some great uh, one-on-one time. But your parallels, Tom, to coaching people through AA and coaching people to be successful in network marketing are phenomenal 30 years sober now yourself and your story about pre-sober and then sober is sobering (laughs) and uh the number of people that you have inspired to pay attention to that habit and how it's killing them and killing their family is i mean it's um hats off to you brother that's some seriously powerful work 
Thanks. Again. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me, uh, my next question. So this is about prospects and Tom, I'm going to start with you. Cause, uh, you know, this is your, uh, this is, this is a profound niche of yours. So the, the question is this, what is the one question? Now I know you have 20 of them, Tom, but you got to pick one. What is the one question that you could ask a candidate prospect, whatever you want to call them, somebody that you know, maybe you've, maybe they know they're a prospect. Maybe, you know, they're a prospect. Maybe they're just a connection. Maybe they're just a friend. So I'm not telling you where you are in the stage of inviting them to take a look. They could be anywhere in that stage. You could have just met them on the beach for the first time, or you could have known them for 30 years. But my question is, what is the one question that you can ask somebody that could lead to them opening their mind and their heart to taking a look at what we do? I think the number one thing I would ask somebody is if they've ever had somebody in business with them whose eyes was popping open at two o'clock in the morning thinking about their problems. Because that question, no one has ever had. They think about their upline, they think about their boss, they think about it all. And they know the only one thinking about their problems is themselves and hopefully their wife or their spouse. And that question always has people go, who is this guy? And then I've got their mind open where I can go where I need to go. Ask that, tell us that question again, Tom. Who have you got in your life whose eyes are popping open at two o'clock in the morning thinking about your problems? Okay, I'm going to get a little tiny bit of role playing out of you. And I'm the prospect and I just answered the question, nobody. <laughs> I'm saying What's that. the next question? Tell me about your life. And I'm going Beautiful. to interview the heck out of them. And then I'm going to come back to them and remember the answers a few days later and ask about their three kids and their grandmother that broke their hip. They'll be flipped out. And then when they told me they wanted to have a car like Adam's, I'm going to go get <laughs> I'm not going to go get them in the car. I'm going to get them a picture of the car and I'm going to write on there. I'm in you. I'm in this dream with you, Mark, and send it to them. And it will be on their refrigerator five years from now. There you go. There's a book right there. Nice job. Adam Green, what's the one question you could ask a prospect that opens them up to wanting to take a look? I want them to start thinking about what life would be like if they didn't have to worry about their finances and what they're doing at their time. So the, the question would be, you know, if time and money were no object, what would your life look like and have them dig into that? It'll probably take some prompting because people don't think that way intuitively. We're, we're kept small, but I want them to expand it. And then the follow-up question is, Is what do you, are, do you have anything on your radar, on your life plan currently that can allow you to have that vision, that life you just laid out? And chances are they don't. And if they do, I might want to hear about it. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, have, I have something that they might be interested in then. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Let's put them right into casting a vision. Carolyn Reitman, I'm a prospect. I may not know it. What's the question? For me, it's two words. It's what if. And the what if can go in either of two directions, depending on how what I know about you or the person. If I know nothing, I have to kind of create a what if out of what I suspect. But the more I know about you, the easier it is to say, what if that it were actually possible? Or what if you don't do something? Um, so that it, it creates in them the imagination, not only of what's possible, but what happens if they don't. Give me an example of a what if. Let's say I'm your mailman. So you've known me kind of superficially for five or 10 years. And we get in a conversation and you find an opening for a what if, what would it sound like? 
Well, let's say I'm my mailman is coming to deliver something and I am packing up the car to leave to go and visit Richard in Australia. And he goes, oh, man, I've never been to Australia. I can't imagine that. How can you do that? I could never imagine leaving my job. And I think that's where it becomes the what if. What if there? What if you had the opportunity to create <coughs> unlimited time off or be able to actually do this, to figure out how to create and have the revenue so that you could accomplish something like this? So I'd be I sort of guessing but in this case, let's say I'm yep. packing up to go somewhere. Yeah, beautiful. And I love the opposite of it. The what if you don't do something about it? That's, uh, that's also really powerful. Mm-hmm. Jordan, what do you got? I'm a prospect. You got one question to ask me that gives you the best shot of leading to me looking at the opportunity. Okay, so this is a little different twist. I bought a $6,000 3D TV when I walked into a Best Buy shopping for a $750 TV (laughs) because somebody said, come here, I want to show you something. The guy said, come here, I want to show you something. He took me into a room, put on the 3D glasses. and, and, And so what I want to do is I want to get permission to continue. So the question I would ask would be something along the lines of, are you okay with me asking you a few questions and then possibly showing you something that might interest you? So I like that. Involved. It's a That's permission good. to continue. It just gets them to say, yes, uh, ask me questions, show me what you got. Yeah. And so is that what the helicopter guy did? He says, Hey, come here. I want to show you something. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Two months later, this helicopter shows up on this truck and trailer. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, I love that. Uh, is it okay if I ask you some questions? That is a question. One question. Is it okay if I ask you a couple questions and then maybe show you something? Yep. Beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> love it. All right, Donna, what do you got? Well, these are all brilliant. And, you know, this is a relationship business. So I just like to ask a lot of questions. You know, what do you do? Um, you get I'll, one, you get okay. one. So <laughs> I'll just go with, um, you know, if you keep doing what you're doing, where do you see yourself in five years? Because one of the things I love about my career is that I help people look at multiple streams of income and adding an income stream. And, you know, what if, you know, I, I would love to, to show you, um, this might be a fit for you. It might not. Um, but let's take a look. Yeah, I love that question, Donna. Uh, if you keep doing what you're doing now, where are you going to be in five years? Which could be, if I keep doing what I'm doing now in five years, uh, I'm going to be a rock star and everything's going to be great. Or right. I'm going to be a train wreck and a yard sale or nothing's going to change. I'm going to die of boredom. But I, I think that that question, Richard, that question, you can't, you can't just walk up to someone and ask that question because no, they're no, no. going to be like, what's wrong with you? No, that uh, wasn't the question, Don. The question wasn't, what's the, the question wasn't, what's the first question you ask someone? Right. The question was, somewhere in the conversation, yes. what is the one question that gives you the best shot of showing them the opportunity at some point? Not just right after the question. So listening audience, if you listen to what everybody said here, these aren't the first things that you ask somebody necessarily. And they don't necessarily lead immediately to showing somebody. But they are questions that these leaders have found. When I get a chance to ask this question, that creates the best possibility for something opening up down the road. It might be two minutes later. It might be two months later. So your question, Donna, is if you keep doing what you're doing now, where are you going to be in five years? Great question. Because it does lead people to answer the question. First, they go up here and they visualize and they either hate what they see. They're either bored with what they see or they love what they see. It gives you a place to go. All right, next question. We'll start with you, Donna, and we'll go backwards to Tom. Now you gotta think, you gotta think back, Donna. <laughs> think back. 
Because most of the people listening to these podcasts are not in network marketing for 40 years. They're in their first year or their second year or their third year. So the question is this, in your first year, if you could go back and grab Donna by the ear, what is the one thing you would absolutely have you do different where you dropped the ball in your first year? Well, I was pretty motivated in my first year because I had to put food on the table. So I really wouldn't change too much about my first year because I had laser focused. I had my blinders on. This was oh dark 100 before computers. And I just absolutely knew that I was going to make this work because I didn't want the alternative. You know, I didn't have a college degree. I didn't want what that life might offer me. Um, and so I just, I, I don't really mean to answer this question wrong, but I wouldn't have changed a thing because I, really, I even hired from day one. I even hired someone to clean my house. I could not afford that, but I did it because the time that it took for, to clean my house was taking me away from building my yeah. business. So I Super was smart. Really yeah. No, I love the way you answer that, Donna, because that's the truth. You wouldn't do anything different. And um, I think the, the, the points that people need to listen to is you had from day one a story, a vision of inevitability that this was going to work. You were very clear about what would happen to you if it didn't work. You were a single mother of three kids, right? Yes. Yeah. Recently divorced, single mother of three kids. You had to make this work, but more importantly, you expected to make it work. And what that leads us to do, folks, is actually do the work. Simple as that. And so good job and super smart to hire a, hire a housekeeper. And any anybody else that makes less than $200 an hour, hire it out. Jordan, I don't know. I've heard your first year, but... I don't remember, but I'll bet this is entertaining. What would you do different your first year? So, so you want me to talk about my first year in network marketing or my first year that I actually did anything in network marketing? Let's, let's call it the first year in network marketing because the first year in network mark not in send out cards. Because if we talk about the first year in network marketing, the obvious is the answer. You know, you might, you might want to have recruited somebody, at least one person. Well, well <laughs> maybe not, Richard. Really, oh. maybe not. Because... That because the reason I'm sitting where I am today is because I had eleven, I had ten years and eleven companies of having no success. That's right. Right. So, so, so the story that I have today, that's been written about in so many books and been on so many shows, wouldn't exist today, and that has helped me. Yes. All right, but if we want to start, send out cards. My first year, uh, starting fourteen years ago. I would say that my only regret is that I didn't take 10% a first time around that I didn't take 10% of my of every single check I got no matter how small or how big and put it away and not and make it disappear and not touch it no matter what my first 8 million dollars I blew it by investing in many 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 businesses of which none of them exist today uh, when you start making money you think you're smart and you're not, and you start investing in things and you lose your money. And so I should have followed Richest Man in Babylon and put away 10% of every single check I received. I'd probably have an additional 25 million bucks sitting in the accounts if I yep. had that. So that's yep. what I would do differently. Super, super smart. Thanks, Jordan. Carolyn, long time ago. I imagine you had a pretty good first year, but I don't know for sure. What would you do different? Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, you get to remember I'm finishing up year number 48. 48. So I was doing business even before Donna when there were dinosaurs and, you know, <laughs> crawling on the planet. 
and there was obviously no internet. We had to make long distance phone calls either before eight o'clock in the morning or after 11 o'clock at night, depending on where you were. Uh, we had no, we had no role models. Basically it was just believe, go out and talk to people and go do it. And then I added to that, the fact that I moved 3000 miles in the middle of my first year to a place where I didn't know anybody. So I started my business when I was in California and ended up moving to Florida. So what would I do differently? I don't know that I do anything differently. I guess I would wish that I had the role modeling and the mentoring that's available now if someone starts for their first year, because we had none. And so every mistake on the planet that we could have made, I made. And I financed my first three or four years of the business on whatever credit card I had paying $50 a month um, because I had to pay airplane tickets to go to wherever my people were and sleep on their couch and eat peanut butter balls, you know, made out of product and you know, <laughs> starve to death and do all of the things that we did when we didn't know what we were doing. But I also knew that the alternative was I didn't want to drive in traffic and commute. I didn't want to go work in an office. I didn't want somebody to tell me I had to work on Thanksgiving Day. And so I might as well put some energy into this and make this work because the alternative was definitely not something I wanted to do. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. Uh... Adam, I'm still smiling thinking about Jordan talking about blowing through his first eight million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he became a real estate empire mogul. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I don't. I'm speechless. Um, <laughs> what I would have done differently is I would have. Um, worked on introducing the business aspect of our business uh, more to my customers at the beginning of their process. Everything was so product oriented. It was only customer acquisition, which is which fine, but I wasn't also getting anybody to partner with me because I wasn't offering. I had no business success story. I didn't have business success stories around me. Um, my posturing was poor and I just was afraid of the business opportunity for the most part. Um, over the years, I got better at it, read the four-year career, developed some success. But in the first year, it was so highly focused on only um, product that I left lots of stuff on the table that I think I could have advanced my success faster had I introduced business sooner on, the opportunity to share the product. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Yep. That's profound. Um... Tom Chenault, first year. I'll never forget it, man. I, mean, I had come out of the airplane sales business and I was a stockbroker and I thought I was all of it in a bag of chips. <laughs> I was newly sober. I was dead broke and my ego was this big and my self-esteem was this big. And I just sold and I signed people up and they would literally, I'd drive by their house the next day and the product I sold them would be in the garbage. I'd go, why'd you do that? And they said, because we knew if we didn't buy, you would never leave. And it was horrific. And I just sold, sold. And I, you know, all, they, all the companies talked about was how many people you signed up. So I thought that meant something. And I'll never forget, I finally realized that it's not about who you sign up, it's who you, who you bring along and who you actually enroll. And I'll never forget a guy came to me at the end of a year and he said, man, you've got so much talent, but you are so arrogant and such a jerk. When are you going to make it about them and not about you? The minute you can make that shift, you're going to be successful. And as much as I wanted to punch that guy in the nose, I actually shifted from me to their agenda right in my second, third year, and it made all the difference in the world. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. Reversing the order. So back to you, Tom. Um, I didn't tell you I was going to ask this question because I just made it up. So you might have to just ponder it for a second and then go whatever comes to your gut. Question is, how, how and when, what happened? Like, paint us a little movie. How and when 
did you realize in longevity, Tom, that you had really made it? And don't give me the humble answer. I know I haven't made it yet. I'm still working on it, blah, 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 blah. Because all of you on this call are million dollar a year earners and you've made it. And you made it in your first year, your second year, your third year, your fourth year, your fifth year. At some point, you had this little epiphany where you said, wow. I, I don't think I could stop this if I tried. In fact, you've tried a few times, haven't you, Tom? <laughs> I've done everything to blow this thing up and get terminated and at sunrise and the whole shit. But when it really hit me was when I followed all of you great mentors. And I want to, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being such an inspiration in my life. And Adam, I'm thinking about you, especially I've got a 27 year old son who I'm going to go find your interview about what you went through with your parents and the path that you had to find for yourself that was truly yours, that you didn't have to think you were living in their shadow. So I'm in awe of all of you. But I'll never forget one of you hot shots said to go on a 90 day run and affect your business no matter how big you, big you are. So I'm such a type A guy. I went on a six month run and I did everything I'm telling people to do. And at the end of that six month run, my check went down. <laughs> I realized for sure, I have nothing to do with this. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I love it. All right. <laughs> Six month run. Check went down. You had the epiphany. This has nothing to do with me. Adam, when did you realize? And do not, Adam, do not give me your humble answer. When did you realize that you, that this was for real, that this was running away from you, that you had knocked it out of the park and you were now going to be wealthy. Uh, well, for a long time, I made money and buried it. You did, didn't you? You And I kind of still do. <laughs> I think the first time I actually like spent it and then saw how quickly it still came back would have been when I realized that like, I could I could actually screw up pretty bad and probably still be okay at this point. So it would have been two years ago when we actually moved to the first house I wanted to really be in. Um, moved to a new area, house in the lake, million dollar home, paid for cash, 27 years old, um, nice affluent community. I'm the youngest person there. We paid for it all up front. So we're not the ones in there who are mortgaged out of our butts. And then the money still kept coming in. And I saw how living a little bit bigger, um, not like bigger being like extravagant, but just how I was actually stretching what I thought was possible for my age, um, for my life. And then seeing it continue to grow from there and how it gave my team permission to grow. Um, every time I've made big moves like that, it's, it's continued to kind of run away. But that was the first time where, you know, I, I spent million bucks up front <laughs> off of the bank account and then i had a little panic attack for a second until i moved in and then the next month commission checks came i'm like oh well, I, i'm gonna be okay yeah a year later you're looking for something else to write a big check for <laughs> <laughs> love it that's good that's good carolyn I can tell you exactly. I was well into my career, 20 plus years, and I made a decision that it was time to go on to the next rank. So I put in, it wasn't three months, it was probably over 12, 15, 18 months of just consistent effort, not really paying a lot of attention to what the records were, so on. But when we got to our conference or whatever it was, I found out that not only was I number one in growth and had accomplished what I wanted to, but the biggest one was we had an incentive trip that year that went from Hawaii to Australia. And they took every single one of us on the same plane to from Hawaii to Australia. 
And my son, my husband, and I got to sit in the first class, and the highest earners in the company had to sit in the back. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so, you know George, you know George and Dee Dee Shaw, so you know exactly who was who was making the noise. What are you doing up front there? I go. I love I'm that. Accepting. First class to Australia, and the top people are in the back. I guess I've made it. Good job, Carolyn. Jordan. Well, um, this, uh, this question, um, it, uh, it's an it's a, it's a interesting question to, to, tr to ponder. Um, I'm sorry, Tom. I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> hit me back with the question once. <laughs> And the next thing we're going to sign you up for is the listening, being present class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the question, Jordan, is when in send oh. out cards, yes. did you realize, oh, my gosh, I, I have made it. I have done it. So the truth is that when I, the day I signed up and the day I got what we were doing, um, and maybe this was partially because I had done it before. But I saw it like I and Donna used the words earlier. She used the word she knew. The truth is, I knew it when I the day I signed up, like it wasn't uh, something that had to happen. But then over the course of my career, I've had points of validation, like when I'm waiting for the helicopter that I'd already purchased to show up or when I bought the ticket to space, you know, that was and, what, and as I was doing that, I was remembering all those people that quit that questioned and doubted whether it was even possible to make money in this thing. And even the people that in the early days of me making a decision to join the company I'm with now, t people telling me that that's a great idea, but you'll never make money there. Mm -hmm. And so as the helicopter showing up or as I'm taking my flight, um, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm glad I followed my heart and didn't listen to what everybody else said, you know, listen to their opinions. Yeah, and for those of you that maybe have not heard Jordan's story, uh, I'm sure he is the only, but he's certainly the first network marketer to have pre-purchased his seat into space on SpaceX, right? Not SpaceX, Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic, yes. Quarter million dollars for a first class seat into outer space. Two and a half hours trip for a quarter million bucks. <laughs> I love it. Hey, Adam Green, what do you think about that? <laughs> I can see where the $8 million went in the first year. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, Donna Johnson, when did you know you'd made it? Oh, gosh. Well, I have five adult children and eight grandchildren, and I guess when they say mom's a celebrity in her own world. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so uh, yours is not economic. Yeah, seriously, about 20 years ago, and Carolyn alluded to this a little bit earlier, you know, we didn't have a lot of mentors or benchmarks uh, for what was possible. And I remember I was really stuck. I was making about 50000 a month, and I just thought I was making gangster money. You know, poor girl from Wisconsin. And um, I just had to take myself to the woodshed and realize that there's a bigger world out there. I was being a little too selfish. And that's when I started supporting the orphanages. And shortly after that, my income went to six figures a month. And then I just realized, get over yourself. You know, um, this is bigger and you can do so much more. But, you know, the saying... Um, you know, the five friends that you're surrounded with, every once in a while, Thomas and I will talk about how cool it is in our lives that some of our best friends are you guys and people like Sharon Lecter and, oh gosh, you know, just, just people that you read about and then they're like, oh yeah, that's my personal friend. So I just, sometimes I want to pinch myself and I'm super grateful and I never, ever want to forget uh, where it is that I came from. Yeah. Good job, Donna. You're, uh, you know, we could do a whole hour on everybody on this call and how it changed the game for all of us 
when we looked for things to do with our money that were way beyond us. Uh, because you can't make enough money to solve the problems of humanity. And when you take one of those problems on to just be a contributor to it, like you have, Donna, then it dwarfs your income. So, you know, if you're making fifty or $100,000 a month and it's all about you, um, you know, that can be a lot of money. But if you're making fifty dollars to $100,000 a month and you've taken on educating a community of disadvantaged kids or youth at risk or sex trafficking or whatever it is, you can't make enough money. So we're going to start with you, Donna, and roll back to Tom. And the final question is, <clears throat> as people are listening to this Hero Call, the purpose of Hero Calls is to give people an opportunity for an event, an epiphany, a breakthrough, um, where all of a sudden, sudden the lights come on and you see things entirely different. You know, we all know that leaders are born at events. And what happens? Why is that? And what is leadership? Well, leadership is people that have, as you've heard on this call, folks, people that have a very clear vision of inevitability. So they just don't have a vision of what they want. Lots of people have that. But the story about what they want is that they're going to get it, that they're going to succeed, that it is inevitable. There's no going back. And so that happens for people at events. And the reason it happens at events is you've got, you know, 500 or 5,000 or 15,000 people who are all on the same vibration and nothing but affirmation after affirmation. So people have these breakthroughs where they say they make a declaration and everything changes for them. And that's what we look to do in the hero calls is give you an hour listening to somebody who can cast a vision in a, a million different ways. And perhaps you get that event that changes everything for you. So listeners, listen up, because I'm going to ask each of these five people to tell you where they see the network marketing model community going. Like, what do you see for the future of what we do? And so part of, part of my question is futuring it, and part of it is impact. So maybe give me 45 seconds on the impact. Maybe reflect on the people that you've involved in the business, the people that you've coached, people that you've seen their lives change, and be as specific as you can. Like, what have you seen actually happen for people that did the work? And where do you see us going as a model in the next 10 to 20 years? Starting with you, Donna. In Great question. Yes. Great question. Jordan. Talk fast, Jordan. Okay. Jordan wants to go first, or do you want me to go, Richard? Sorry. No, you go, Donna. <laughs> All right. Well, our new French owners, uh, huge in retail all over Europe, uh, they chose Arbon because of network marketing. And, you know, look at all the retail stores going down. And yes, people shop online, but they're missing a personal experience and they're missing, missing the opportunity for an entrepreneurship. So I believe if we can continue to grow our profession and raise the bar of the integrity and ethics going on, stop the hype and, um, you know, the legacy companies like you talked about, uh, we are going to be the business model of what people are looking for out there, not retail, not just shopping online, but having that experience of personal service, of entrepreneurship. I believe uh, it's going to be the wave of the future. If we can get it right. If we can get it right. If we can get it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all are getting it right. Jordan, what do you, what do you see as impact for the people on your team? And what do you see for the future? 
Yeah, uh, I think technology has made it really easy for people to start companies. And then there also is governmental pressure to run to run ethical organizations. Organizations, as Donna mentioned, uh, aren't high, aren't uh, making outrageous income claims, lying to people, um, you know, exaggerations, hype, all that stuff. So the pressure is going to be there for companies that really focus on real customers uh, and not make uh, false promises. That pressure is going to be there. And at the same time, uh, what's happening is I think there's a, a realization in the corporate communities that uh, there is no security in a job anymore. And I think most people, like when I started in network marketing, Richard, when you started, when most of us started, um, we used to believe that security, many people believe that security was in companies, but I think today most people don't believe that. So there's more people that are open to opportunity today than ever before. And network marketing gives people a real chance to go out and create something that can provide a lifestyle that no cubicle will ever provide. So that's what I see. I see that, it, that the future will become brighter and at the same time, it will, it will be, there will be pressure on the the companies that don't operate in an ethical way yeah love that so the legacy legitimate real product companies are going to rise to the top and everybody else is going to get squeezed out carolyn i'd like to pick up on the word legacy and use that as really my commitment is to the generations that followed Adam to the people that are growing up in my son's um, my son's generation. I'll give you a quick example. After my son had graduated from college, I got a phone call from him. He'd taken his first job. I got a phone call from him and he said, Mom, I'm really nervous, but I think I want to go independent. I think I want to go freelance. And I know that I have to make sure that I talk to the accountant. I have to have my corporation set up. I know I've got my QuickBooks just about ready to go. I need to get my domain name. We just help me put those things together. And honestly, I was stunned. I mean, to hear those words come out of my son's mouth at young 20s, I thought, where in the world did he get this? And I realized it must have been things that he'd grown up hearing because it certainly wasn't anything it came immediately directly from me. So what I see as a part of our future is being able to create the options for financial education, for personal development, for, for people learning how to communicate. I have a high school mentee that I was talking to yesterday and she was trying to figure out how to tell a student something. And I realized just like out of, it's like out of our DNA. I said, have you thought about doing this and this and this and this? And she goes, oh, wow, that's a great idea. And to realize that those are the things that are part of our heritage that we've had to learn in order to survive and thrive in what we do, but to be able to create that legacy of passing those kinds of things on to the generations that follow us. Yeah. Well, beautifully said, Carolyn. Thank you. Let that sink in. Adam Green. Well, I see us, we're living in an age of empowerment where people are hungry for to become self-empowered. They want to make more informed choices with their family's health and wellness. They want to be empowered in how they earn an income. And we're not just taking, you know, the system um, a answers, uh, we're not just subscribing to what society always is told what we have to do. And uh, so I see this next generation, specifically my generation, it's a generation that's looking for the opportunity to do things on their own terms. And so in my business, um, a lot of my, my most successful members are parents, their moms, who are not only like raising a family while they're building their business. And so I've seen so many families who... They've been able to live their life on their own design, go if they have time to homeschool now because they don't have to go to a job. Um, they can work it around their business. The most impactful story I've had recently is one our, our most successful member who has built a, uh, a business of over 20,000 people, multiple six-figure earner, is deciding she wants to escape Canadian winter this year. She's a homeschooling mom of four children under the age of 10. 
and she's going to New Zealand for the winter, Hawaii and New Zealand, and they're going to like world school. So they're able to teach their kids on the road, build their business because our, our business operates there. And they're able to completely like design this dream life. And it works well with their family instead of sacrificing their family to climb a corporate ladder and be away um, so much of their life. So we're, we're in an age of empowerment. We're in a gig economy, people. It's becoming so much more acceptable to earn an income from your phone on the go. People are, you know, putting rooms um, through Airbnb. They're renting their cars on Turo. They're they're uh, driving cars on Uber. There's all these different ways people can have a side hustle. And so network marketing is going to just become more and more the norm of a way that people can earn income outside of their current job. Yeah, beautiful, Adam. <clears throat> Do you ever, so Adam, does, does it ever, do you ever uh, wonder, so when you listen to people like, well, all of us who have been doing this for 30 to almost 50 years, do you ever wonder what you're going to be like in network marketing when somebody's interviewing you and you say, yeah, I've been doing this full time for 48 years. I haven't thought beyond 30 yet, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, Tom Chanel. What's the impact people can expect from participating in this community? And where do you see it going? First of all, I have no idea what Turo is, Uber, side hustle gig. That was like a different language to this old dinosaur. So that's exciting. And what's so cool you know, there's something out there called failure to launch that these kids, even with college degrees, are absolutely petrified because they think they have no shot. And what I love about network marketing is I think it truly is the last frontier for an entrepreneur. The cost of entry is so low. The upside is so high. And I think we've got a chance here. And we talked about legacy companies. We talk about a responsibility to the profession that us older people do have to show people that ethical business is the only way to go. And we have to protect this because it is the true last goose that laid the golden egg. There aren't secure jobs. There aren't easy to get into franchises. Small business is absolutely impossible to do with, how, with the startup costs and what it costs to do that. And we're there. We're it. And it's on us to educate people that this can be done by literally anybody with the desire to do so and the training skills like the four-year career and what all of you have been able to do. So I think we are in the right spot and we have a huge responsibility toward future generations to make sure that it stays high integrity and highly profitable for people. So thanks, Richard, for letting me be part of this. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Hey, and thank all of you. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, um, wow, when there's five of you, we could easily do two hours. I don't think we'd bore anybody. But I promised everybody an hour. We're a little over an hour. So listening audience, I uh, want to thank you for joining us and participating, whether you are listening live or you're listening within a week of this broadcast or you're listening five years from now somewhere around the world. Um, thank you for your time and attention. And I would just have you think about two things in parting. If you are considering doing network marketing or if you're already doing it, think about this. You got two options when it comes to income. You can pursue an opportunity that might pay you what looks like easier earned income. Like, wow, I can promote this product. This is an exciting product. This is a trendy company. This is, has lots of flash and flam. And like, maybe I can make some money. But I want to tell you, and everybody on this call would tell you, that you can make extra money doing all kinds of things, a million things. You can work at Walmart and make extra money. But where in the world... Can you work for three or four years on a pretty part-time basis and then get paid for 40 or 50 or 60? Yeah, I owned my own network marketing company for 34 years and I ended up paying a great, you know, a grandchild 
So I recruited a guy who was about 65 years old. He worked for 10 years. He built a huge income. He retired. Two years after he retired, he died. Two years later, his wife died. So we started paying his daughter. His daughter died at the age of 43. So we started paying the granddaughter at the age of 14. You have two opportunities here in network marketing. You can pursue an in earned income opportunity, or you can pursue an asset income opportunity, one where you have the potential to be paid forever, your children, your grandchildren. And to do that, you got you to gotta pay very close attention to what company you choose to join and ask a lot of questions about, wow, if I want to get paid for 50 years, how do I know this company is going to pay me? And the last thing I want to leave you with is that the work is worth it. One of the things that we all know on this call is every one of you listening can do what we did. You can do the work. The work is pretty simple. If you get your mind and your heart right, if you get the conversation flowing right in your body, you can actually do what needs to be done. And you can do it in probably... 30 minutes to 60 minutes a day. You can do it. And the reason people don't do it is they don't do enough homework or study or belief building to be able to answer this question that the work is going to be worth it. But think about it. If you worked for an hour a day for four years, Maybe doing something you've never done before, maybe working through your comfort zone on something, but then you really did get paid for 40 or 50 years. Your kids got paid. Your grandkids got paid. Question is, is it worth it? For all of us, totally worth it. We can't make that decision for any of you, but we do thank you for joining us and um, thank all of you, Donna and Jordan, and Carolyn, and Adam, and Tom for being the historic 100th network marketing hero call from Bliss Business. We're signing off. Over and out. Okay.